Welcome to the Relational Recovery Podcast. I'm your host, Wes Thompson, joined by my co-host, Austin Hill. Today, we are talking about relinquishing control. We're talking about trust. We're talking about letting go. So we hope this conversation is helpful, and thanks for listening. Hey, Austin. Hey, Wes. How are you this morning? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good. That's good. Today, um, I'm going to start by just reading this passage from Matthew 16. There's a lot of themes that we were just discussing before we hit record that I think flow out of this. Um, cause, cause in this passage, you know, we're, there's the theme that I think I want to hone in on is the theme of letting go of acceptance. Um, cause within that theme, there's just so many other subject matter, um, like trust control, giving things to God, relinquishing what's happened. Even just the, the idea of God's Lordship, like he's God, we're not, there's things we don't know. And we've got to accept that. Um, letting go of what others think about us. Um, letting go of the past, accepting trust, forgiveness. Uh, So anyways, (laughs) lots of, lots of things that we could delve into from here, but, Matthew 16, Jesus looks to his disciples and he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man gain in return for his soul? For the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father and then he will repay each person according to what he's done. Truly, I say to you, there's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Um, and I think, you know, we're not here to unpack all of this passage and what Jesus means and his intentions. But I think I, think I really want to hone in on... Um, this idea of if anyone had come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life. will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, my initial reaction to that is I think I want to set the stage that throughout the Bible, God, you know, even in the beginning, God made us in his image and, um, and his likeness and, and, and Genesis one ends by him saying that it was very good. And there's this perfect relationship between man, the man, Adam and God in, in the first two chapters of, of Genesis. And so I don't think that uh, this denial in, in, ver- in verse 24 of chapter 16, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. I don't think he's saying deny yourself because, because there's something you're such, you're so terrible and unlovable. There's not a denying that is um, because because God does not love us, but it's rather <clears throat> I think I think it's it's an invitation to follow that requires um, such an amount of trust that we have to deny uh, our need for control and deny um, you know there's going to be aspects of of what we want and what we what we think we need that we will have to deny. There's a, there's a, um, there's this, this paradox in Christian theology that says something to the effect, right? Of in order to gain your life, you must lose your life. And in losing your life, you gain life. And it, it's this, it is, it does speak to, I think this idea of the Lordship of, of God that, that there, that he's in control and he's inviting us to trust him. Um, so it's not a denial that, you know, there's something that we are bad, but it's a denial of it, it, in order to find the good. Um, it's only in this, it's only in this relinquishing of control to God that we actually find what it is that we're looking for, which is true life and which is peace. And, um, and so this idea of letting go, of relinquishing, 
comes up a lot in the Bible. Um, you know, I was just reading about the Exodus story and uh, remembering how really looking into the history of it. And it's fascinating to think that the people were so, that God's people, Israel in its infancy was so dependent upon God. There was so much self-denial involved. I mean, to, to, to cross the Red Sea was completely um, in. They had to trust God when they were crossing um, the desert, you know, the Sinai Desert. They were um, to God, obviously leading to Mount Sinai where, where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. That journey would have been arduous and difficult, and um, they relied on God to literally bring them food miraculously throughout the, throughout the days. Um, so there's this idea throughout scripture and I, you know, we could go on and on. My point is, is like part of following God is, is recognizing that we are, we are not God and um, things happen in this life that are difficult and hard to, hard to understand and hard to make sense of. And we live in a world where, uh, many people believe that we determine truth and, and ultimate goodness for ourselves. And that leads to um, a radical sense of our own importance. And even though we are important to God and we are important to each other, when we overemphasize our own importance to the point that it supersedes our reliance and trust on God, it leads to, I think, the anxieties and the depressions and the fears that so plague many of us because we weren't meant to bear that kind of weight. Um, I don't think the soul is meant to bear that kind of weight. And so, again, w today we're kind of framing this conversation that this relinquishing, this letting go, this acceptance. Today, at least, we're not, I'm not even framing this as a bad thing. It's like this is actually the way to the good life is learning to trust. And I think that's why evil traffics in pain and what, and what you know, in the therapy world we call trauma because, because evil – if we do believe that there is a personified evil that wants to seek out to kill, steal, and destroy, what a better way than through pain to make the masses of people distrustful so that they can never put their reliance on anyone other than themselves, which is a kind of hell. It's a kind of earthly hell. So, those are a couple of thoughts um, as we look at this passage, Austin. What um, there's so many different directions we could go, but given what I just said, is there anything that stands out to you? Yeah, I think that when we hear the idea of like, what does it mean to to let go or to to accept something or to trust that things will be for our benefit in the future? Um, I think acknowledging that it takes an awful lot of uh, courage and almost like um, counterintuitive belief because we all have experiences in our past where like, man, I trusted this person and they took advantage of me or I, I thought I could do this and I couldn't um, or like, I'm just not, that's not my skill set or um, they, that like I had a belief that like, Oh, this is what my life is going to look like. And then it radically changed. Um, so it's, there's plenty of reasons for us to not trust people, to not trust situations. And so the amount of courage it takes to take that initial step of, of letting go of a challenging situation, it doesn't mean like the courage is not like not think it's not like, well, I'm just not going to think about it. I'm just going to let go and let God take care of it. So I'm going to do nothing. That's not what this, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about acknowledging that some things are going to be outside of our control and we should still do our best and try our hardest to live the lives that God created us to live. 
which is not one of laziness and uh, selfishness or just kind of like, ah, oh, what, what will be, will be, even though that's true. But God, God was a very proactive person. When Jesus was here, he was like a walking example of what it meant to let go and let God take care of things. But he was constantly doing things. He was constantly being confronted with challenges that forced him to trust that God had his back. He experienced setbacks. Um, he was lied about. He was, he was, um, he was taken advantage of like all those different things that we're afraid of that we've all experienced, but he still trusted that God had him, but that it doesn't mean he is passive. And that's not what we're talking about when we're, when we say letting go, it's like, Oh, you know, like that guy's just going to treat me poorly. So I'm just going to let God take care of it. Like, no, we have to, we have to stand, stand up for ourselves. We have to remain strong. We have to point out things that are not appropriate or disrespectful. And then like, cause those are the things that we can control are our actions, not other people's. And I think that's the, that's kind of the tension that you were talking about earlier. It's a part of it. And that's what it looks like in practice is I'm going to continue to do something that I believe to do because I know it's the right thing to do, even though the outcome, I don't know what it's going to be. could be bad for me. could be good for me. I hope it's good for me, but oftentimes, uh, holding someone accountable, we hope the outcome is good. Like, like we were building trust with somebody by holding them accountable, but then they res respond poorly and they don't trust us as much or they don't like us or appreciate what we said. But like, that's, that's what we let go of when we decided to take that step, when we decided to do what was right right now. So it is a, um, it's, I think we, I know that in a lot of the conversations I've had in the past is like when I hear someone say, man, you just got to let go and let God. It's because somebody is constantly putting energy into um, like worrying about this situation or this person or being anxious about it or trying to control somebody by like, man, if I don't do this, they're going to do this and then this will happen and then this will happen and my life will be ruined. It's just like, man, you just got to let go and let God like that's still, you should still do stuff but knowing that you can only do so much and it's not like, Hey, whatever I do, then I can control somebody. And if you're trying to control other people, you're going to just be constantly exhausted because <laughs> you can't like, you can't control people. And that that's like, you can hold people accountable and there are consequences to your actions, but man, like there are not that many things that are within your control but you are, you're in your control. It's funny that you bring up the, you know, let go and let God. I think both you and I, um, maybe it's because I'm an old millennial or what, I don't know, because of like the hyper uh, marketed youth groups that I went to as a kid. I don't know, but I'm always very, uh, I'm always, I always kind of shy away, not shy away. I'm always kind of, really dislike and push away from Christian subculture and Christian like little sayings for some reason. But to be fair, right. The saying, let go and let God, like you said, it, um, th th it is, it is like, it is, I just think those sayings require nuance. And I guess the nuance I would say is when we pray, that's what we're doing. Essentially. I'll give an example just in the last day when I think I had to let go <laughs> and let God, which is funny because I've never I've thought about it in that way. But in this moment I am. Yeah, I remember last night, you know, Stella, my daughter was, she's getting new emotions. She's, um, she's nine. Um, so she's not a teenager yet, but she's, um, very soon displaying. She's displaying a lot more like just new emotions. Like, uh, uh, frustration, salty, salty. Yeah. She just is pushing back and questioning and, and, um, uh, and she was really upset last night and, um, I sat down and talked with her. She made a couple of bad decisions and I sat down and talked to her and she was so upset and angry with me. And, um, she asked to be alone. She's like, can you just leave me alone? And so I walked out of her room and, um, 
It was, I literally, literally, there was a moment where I paused, I shut her door, I paused and I just prayed for her. And I just, I consciously, um, I literally said in that moment, I rem- the only words I remember saying is like, God, um, I trust, I trust that you're a better dad than me and that you love Stella more than I do. So please comfort her in this moment, um, that she obviously doesn't want to talk to me. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that, I think, again, it sounds like insensitive and goofy whenever we're going through pain. And that wasn't really painful, but like, and somebody just says, oh, let go and let God, brother, you know? Um, but I think I felt in that moment last night, like that was an example of, I, I'm not, I'm trying, you know, I'm not a perfect dad. I'm not a perfect Christian. I'm not a perfect man. I'm doing I'm trying to do my best to lead her and love her in a way that she knows she's loved, she's safe and that she belongs and that she loves the Lord. But ultimately I don't control that. So there's a level of like letting go (laughs) and letting God. (laughs) Um, It's kind of sounds so funny saying that, but, um, but I think, I think for a lot of us, I hope that sparks some thoughts for anyone listening because like there's those moments, right? Where it's scary. You want control. Like maybe, maybe you're in the refuge and like you, um, you haven't seen like your mom and you, and and you're really close to your mom or you haven't seen your spouse or you're not seeing your kids. And there's just this feeling of like, what are they doing and are they okay? And, um, maybe I need to be doing something. And it, Those are normal. There's nothing wrong with those. But at the same time, a lot of times, at least for me, those are grabs for like control. Um, I, I, if I was there, everything would be okay. (laughs) And it's like, that's not necessarily true. Is it? Um, so I'm curious, Austin, for you, like how, how does this letting go? How has that showed up? Maybe to give just a real life example, how's that? Sh- is there anything you can think of, of where that's been challenging or where you've had to practice that in your life recently? So, um, that's a good question. I'm trying to find a, find a good specific one instead of just being vague and using a bunch of Christianese. Um, Yeah, I would say that a lot of it, um, I think recently, a lot of the, the, the longer conversations, like how my wife and I talk with each other, like we have three daughters, they're all pretty much teenagers. One's almost not a teenager. So we've, we have a lot of heavy conversations because they're, they're getting older and their decisions are becoming more and more, um, will have more and more consequences for them. And so there's always that concern, uh, And we could, if we wanted to, we could just fret about them all the time. And there are certain, like, we want to be proactive with certain things and help guide them because that's our job is to try to be, you know, put up guardrails for them that are appropriate and figuring out which guardrail is best for which kid. And recently we've had a lot of, and over the summer, it was a lot of just like kind of heavy conversations. And we got to the point where my wife was like, can, like, we need to have these conversations, but can we not have them every day? Can we just pick a day? to have them. And to me, like I I was, I don't have, I'm not that person. I could talk about this stuff all the time. I haven't exhausted myself yet with that recently. So it's accepting that, um, there are, there are times when I have to not be verbally processing it with my wife, how our kids are doing. So it's like being okay. Um, or in, I, I, yeah, not, it's not being okay. It's accepting that like, this will still be here. We will still be able to talk about it. I don't have to talk about it all the time. I can, pr- I can actively trust that God has my kids more than I do. So I don't have to talk it to death to make sure that they're okay. When that's just how I would, how p- some people seek out comfort and how I do uh, is in those situations is like, make sure I'm not missing something. So it's like looking at it from a million different angles. When my wife is, is, is much uh, clearer and decisive when it comes to the kids that she's able to see cut through stuff a lot faster 
she's just internal internalizes it. And then she's able to like have a conclusion and then we talk through it and I process things differently. So it's realizing, Hey, we're different people. And we come to, we often come to the same conclusion. We don't need to exhaust each other with it. So that was like being like when I, it's ending a conversation when I didn't think it was like, man, we haven't, we've just barely scratched the surface. How do you, how, how are you okay with not coming to a conclusion on this? So it's just being okay or accepting that I'm going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And being uncomfortable is uncomfortable. Yeah. It's not fun. We do a lot of weird stuff to get comfort. Yeah, we do. We do. We do. A lot of bad behaviors have been made seeking comfort in the wrong way or what we think is going to be comforting. Right. And that's, that's a lot of the letting go. It's like, what is actually like, am I seeking out comfort or am I seeking out a life worth living? Mm. Cause if we seek out comfort, then we're constantly doing stuff that doesn't make sense. That's leading to a life of like more anxiety, more frustration, more isolation. Cause I just want to be comfortable when in fact, what we want, like all of us want deeply to be known and connected to other people, which means we're going to be rubbing up against people that aren't us. So I think seeking out comfort as the number one priority is going to lead to a really miserable life that you're alone. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. There's been a lot written about that. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that we're not trying to make the communities that we're in or the groups that we're in, you know, ex like fun to be with, but it's, we're not looking for, we're looking for a life worth living where we're living on, on purpose with a purpose, not a comfortable life. Cause that's not going to give you fulfillment. You're going to be bored out of your mind and alone. Yeah. Comfort is not a bad outcome, but it's a really terrible thing to aim for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, and, and when we're talking, I just want to be very clear. I'm not talking about like, well, I need to live, I need to sleep on a card, like in a cardboard box or on a plywood bed or not have a pillow or, you know, it's a, it's okay to have nice things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the practices and relationships we have. Well, yeah. And just, and maybe saying this will kind of clear up like growth to grow personally requires discomfort. Yep. So if we're always chasing comfort, um, we're never going to push ourselves to do the hard thing mm -hmm. and trust and letting go and acceptance is hard. Yeah. Um, it's easier to stay where we are. It's the, the type of discomfort where it's the type of discomfort. So, yeah, I think there's healthy, just like with, like we talk about ditches a lot, it's there's healthy and unhealthy discomfort. And um, I, we've talked, uh, talked about between acute pain and um, what's the other one? Shoot. Chronic pain. Chronic. Thank you. So chronic pain is not good. We're just letting something get worse and fester. Acute pain is, is painful, but it leads to something better. Like exercise. Mm -hmm. Like exercise. Chronic pain. Like chron healthy. Yeah. Like chronic back <laughs> pain because like you don't have a strong core. You don't have good abs or like any at all. Yeah. You're going to have chronic back pain You're gonna, and you're going to slowly deteriorate. But the acute pain of doing the work like running or rowing or sweat or like cardio stuff. Cardio sucks, but it's, it's acute pain and it'll make you healthier. That's the difference. So as we kind of wrap this up, I think, I think, um, letting go and accepting and uh, ultimately realizing that God, that, that there's things outside of our control is hard. I think that's the point we're trying to make. And um, I think, I think we've been trying to nuance this to, to let us realize like one of the biggest criticisms of Christianity in the last hundred years came from like Karl Marx when he said, you know, religion is the opium of the masses is one of the famous quotes. And, the point he's trying to make there is, is kind of in reference to this topic. He's saying if, if people, you know, if you get people to believe in this higher power and, and then they just don't move, like you've, you've kind of created a very nimble people. 
um, again, the opium of the masses, it kind of sedates them, numbs them to pain. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Okay. Um, this letting go and this acceptance, it's not this flippant living. Okay. It's not that we don't care. It's not that we just let things, you know, let painful things happen and just go, Oh, it doesn't matter anyway. Cause I'm going to heaven. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about though, is when we try to hold on to control so much so that we can't trust God and we can't trust trustworthy people, it will only lead to more pain and suffering. There is, there is an element of trust that is required um, in, this, in this life because we are made by God, because we are not in control that trust is required. And because most people in recovery, most people on this planet have trust issues because the people that were supposed to show up didn't show up perfectly. And as a result, we don't trust well. And we often also aren't incredibly trustworthy all the time. So the trust problem persists. And I know that you're like, well, if you're listening, you're probably like, wow, this is delving into a trust conversation. Well, we talk about, yeah, surprise. We talk about trust a lot at the refuge because trust is really foundational for a lot of the stuff we deal with. So learning to accept what's happened to us or really choosing to accept um, and, and letting go of our worries and our anxieties and our, what else? And then, and then doing the best we can with what we can control and trusting God and trusting trustworthy people. Um, that, that is a practice that leads to more, to more joy and to more fulfillment because, because the other way is, um, is, is going to overwhelm and exhaust the soul. It just will. It just will. I think again, just to close out, this is why Jesus said, right? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Again, there is, there is a finding of what we ultimately want that comes when we, when we are able to relinquish control and trust that God is loving that God loves you and, um, and that he's put people in your path, um, that, that want to love you and that you, and then, and then ultimately be awakened to the fact that you are now called to be a trustworthy person and to, um, to lead in a way that is loving and gracious to those around you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Relational Recovery Podcast. We'll be back soon with a new conversation. We'll see you then. Oh,